Bailing this particular field is very exciting for us. It's a big day. It is literally the field 25 feet away from the farmhouse that my dad still lives in and I grew up in. So it's just, it's a lot of fun when we do this field. It's really well drained. We have a bunch of field tower running through it. It grows a phenomenal crop. We usually get, we usually get four cuttings a year off of it. Most other pieces we get two to three. It's just a really nice special piece to us. And the hay is always great. This particular cutting came in extremely thick with alfalfa. So being that it's only four, like 4.6 acres or something, we were able to play with it and try to get the alfalfa made just perfect. Just perfect. You might be wondering how we got here and how I can use these audacious terms like perfect. Well, you're in luck because after you give this video a thumbs up and subscribe, if you haven't already, I'm going to walk you through how we made this alfalfa, the most finicky, timely, precise crop we make. Maybe not perfect, but definitely good enough for who it's for. The first step in this anxiety-ridden, tear-inducing, emotionally damaging venture of making dry hay in Northeast Ohio, we first scour multiple weather sources, teasing us with at least four days of dry, sunny weather to take the crop to at least below 20% moisture. Once a date has been offered by Mother Nature, but absolutely not guaranteed because she will take away, we set off. In this instance, with our mix match John Deere Moco and Massey Ferguson tractor. Alongside accommodating weather, we hedge our bets with using the best conditioning system we believe exists, the John Deere Steel on Steel Tri-Lobe Rollers. Now this is a full contact roller. The entire stem of the plants are crushed and not crimped. This is going to really pester some crimping fanatics but it's our belief. Anyway, after passing through the rollers, we lay out the hay in a swath as wide as possible. In an ideal world, we would be running self-propelled mowers and not running over already mowed hay, but we do not live in an ideal world. We live in a world of out of control inflation and skyrocketing interest rates and skepticism and hesitation to make huge investments. So we make do with what we have and we make the best of it. This tractor is new to us this year the 7715 and it runs the mower and now runs one of the barons. We're very happy with the way it has fit into our operation. Now we'll move on to arguably the most controversial and we think important aspect of drying out alfalfa. This is a tedder. You can call the act of using this tool tedding or if you are someone who likes to watch the world burn you can call it teddering. Ugh, feels wrong. Anyway, I failed to document the first pass with the tedder, which was the morning after mowing and when the nightly dew was pretty well burned off and an RPM speed probably north of 500 to really get an even spread across the ground. This footage is now the beginning of day three. Day one mowing, day two tedding, once, and day three tedding again, but with a twist. Mother nature taketh and mother nature giveth. She tricked the meteorologist into thinking we had four days of nice weather. But this morning, we realized our time was cut short and the hay had to go today. My dad went out and tedded this in a very cautious way. As you can see, the machine is not spinning very quickly. He is hardly above an idle here, and the theory behind this practice is to gently pick the hay up off the damp ground and help it air out better. At this point in time, we had to make a game day decision. The hay was definitely not dry enough to rake, and with tomorrow's looming threat of rain, we needed to do all we can to help dry the crop out. Surely there was a little bit more leaf loss than if we hadn't tedded it a second time, but a little bit of leaf loss is way better than rained on hay the next day. So that's the scenario we chose. And it worked. About four hours later, we had a crop dry enough to roll into a windrow. Management of the rotary rake is extremely important at this point, and few do it better than my dad. He is at an idle right now, and matching his ground speed as to do a good job cleaning the hay up, but also being as gentle as physically possible to the plants to maintain leaf retention. This 5075E John Deere is almost never unhooked from the Coon rotary rake, and you seldom see anyone driving this combination but my dad. He claims it is one of his favorite tractors. Others on the farm do not rate it quite as highly. It's a bit of a stiff ride with pretty much no room for drinks. We know my dad truly likes it from an economic standpoint because he got such a good deal on it years ago that it has paid for itself countless times. Should he be wearing a hat? Probably. But no one has ever seen my dad in a hat. And you know what they say, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. And you saw the steps we took to doing that. Let's see how it came out in the bale. It 
case you didn't know, there's actually two sides. Well, <laughs> there's two sides to every bale, but there is a visual difference to a side of an alfalfa bale. The side that comes out of the baler first usually has a lot better leaf retention because it wasn't getting beaten into the bale from behind the, the, the way the plunger mechanism works. It, it doesn't quite get it beat as bad. So, you'll see a lot of nice leaf on this. Not quite as much. That side got beat and bashed and beat and bashed. And this side was sort of doing the bashing, but I guess it just ends up being a little nicer. Take a look at the bale. Nice, uniform, tight bale. About 34 inches. Yeah. <laughs> There's definitely a leaf. Alfalfa is very much a bittersweet crop for us to make. Um, as you saw earlier in the video, every single thing we did to this field was very timely, very thoughtful, and there was a reason why we we're doing it when we did. We did a really great job getting a tremendous amount of leaves still on the plant into the windrow, which is great. Um, that's a victory there. And then when you bale, unfortunately you do have some leaf shatter, but you just try to get enough to stay on the bale to make it uh, appropriate. We sell to the equine market, so yes, uh, tests and feed value is important, but the aesthetics of the bale and just some softness and leaf on the stem is usually enough to make people happy. I know that's kind of funny, but you are feeding the person as much as you're feeding the horse, it seems. And these are definitely making some beautiful bales. They are probing pretty consistently, uh, 15 to 19%. There is a lot of leaf on these bales. Um, you can tell that the hay is not as dry as maybe some 6% 6, 6 first cutting, but it's definitely dry enough that it should keep, and it's just phenomenal color. Nice tight flakes. My dad is running the baler at a, about a perfect speed. You have under two inch flakes here. Looks to be maybe 18 on, on this bale or so. So that'll feed real nice. Break apart, beautiful. About 45 pounds, maybe a little heavier. That one could be close to 50. 34 inches. And we'll hop in with the old man and see what he has to say about this. <laughs> There's not much room with Lou. Oh, uh, Lewis. There he is down there. <laughs> the leaf retention on the bales is excellent. That's what we want. Yep, and the preservative to it. We probably wouldn't bale a whole day at near 20%, but we'll give this a try. Yeah, it's, it's fun to see what it's going to keep. Yep. I'm guessing it will. If yeah. there's enough dry stuff in it, the moisture should translocate and it should be all right. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's Pete, left on the gator. Pete and bone. Pete and bone. Alfalfa's a little different than, you know, basic first cutting grass, Dad. What did you do? I got a lot of you filming, but I had I don't have you talking about it. How did you treat this field differently? Well, you, it's, you just kind of treat alfalfa general because when you rake it, tend it, anything, you want the machine going slow because if you don't, you just beat the leaves off it. And that's what we're trying to hold on is the leaves. So when I ran the tether, the first time through, we ran it pretty fast because it was real green and, and they were hanging on just fine. But uh, the second time through, we just we just idled it along and, and almost sort of put in a little bit of a windrow with the tether. And then the same thing with the rake, we just took it easy. Did you do any, was there any timing involved in that? Well, you, the first time we tethered it, there was still plenty of dew on it. Uh, the next time we tetted it, we made sure the dew burned off and we fluffed it up just so the bottom would get dried out good too. Raking, I just idled along today. And you did it? It, it was, it, you had the dew just about completely burned off before we rolled it up. Just because we knew it was going to be cloudy today. Yep. You don't see a tremendous amount of dust behind the baler or anything. We definitely got humidity today. Yep. Right in this rain that's coming in tonight. Pretty tough to get stuff dry in three days this time of year, and this has only three, been down three days, so we're pretty lucky. So, Dan, we grow, well, pretty much exclusively Timothy, Orchard, and Alfalfa. Yes. And uh, some pure Timothy, and then a lot of Timothy Orchard Alfalfa mixes. Yeah. So, this is coming in nearly pure Alfalfa. There's a little bit of Orchard that shows. What would you say that you like about this? This type of crop conditioner, what would you say that you maybe dislike? Or I would like to see a little bit more grass mixed in with it because it's just a, a lot easier to keep the leaf re retention on the alfalfa if we have a little more grass in it. This field was, 
it was actually pretty darn thin this spring, and I don't know what happened before the alfalfa sure did come on in the second and third cutting. So you got me how that happened. I guess on, on the opposite end of that, is there anything that you, you like about alfalfa? Oh yeah, it's, it smells good. Yeah, it <laughs> but it's dry. It seems to act, when we get dry in the middle of summer, it does seem to come back for some tonnage. Yeah, it, it, it definitely handles the dry conditions better because you get a real dry month, at least you're gonna have alfalfa coming up. The grass almost goes dormant when it gets dry. So here's my plan. I am going to run one of the new, brand new, bale barons. And this is my first time in it. This differs from the machines we used to run because the Arcusins made 20, or I'm sorry, the Arcusins, the D14s, made 14 bale bundles. The Bale Baron makes 21 bale bundles. So you jam up 21 in there, knot it up, and it slide back down here. It's actually pretty similar mechanisms to a large square baler, if you're familiar with those at all. You have your injector, so you could call that, you know, your, your stuffer arms or whatever of the large square that feeds the bales up. And then you have a large plunger that pushes it back. And once it reaches a certain length, or seven bundles long, 21 bales in total, it ties it off. I have zero training on this machine. No one showed me how to run it. I'm hopping in with no, no previous knowledge. I'm diving in the deep end right away and I'm learning how to swim. I've been told it's fairly easy, so I should be able to handle it, right? This machine functions off a uh, small thousand PTO. So when I turn the PTO on, I'll, be, I'll want to run at 1,000 RPMs. And there's basically two main controls that you operate from the cab. On hydraulic one, we have the side, to, or I'm sorry, it looks like we have the pickup. So hydraulic two, you can swing the machine left and right. So I will swing it out, and that's hydraulic two, and that gives you some variability in trying to grab a bale. I have my PTO on. I have it running at, it varies, right about a thousand, you can see. So I believe all I have to do is press and hold that to get this to turn on automatic mode. Press and hold for one second. We are on auto mode. As you can see, the pickup is now spinning. The table back there is spinning. I'm only going 2.7 uh, right now because I'm trying to film and feed the very first bale. There you have it. Went in. Around the table, stuffed it up, and we're off to the races. Let's see how this goes. I am looking up at my mirror up there, which is angled right at the pickup. So I can see the bales going right in. That actually works pretty well. Okay, this is far too difficult to do while holding the camera, so I'm gonna get going a little bit and get the drone up in the air and then we'll see what's going on. Maybe I'll get out and talk about it. Okay, we've got it rolling now. I got around the field one time, so now I'm not fighting my spacing because there's no bales to the left of me. All I'd have to do is dodge a bundle when I finally drop it. And I didn't drop a bundle, but I hardly did right at the very end. So now this is very easy, cruising along. I'm going 8.2, I could be going much faster. I'm just trying to get a feel from the machine. Speed is, Apparently no issue for it. I mean, it's just gobbling it up. We will get back over where I dropped the first bundle and we'll check out the hay and we'll look inside the machine and try to figure out what's going on together. That is a warning, one more, and it is about to tie off. So you should hear a beep in a second. Plunger compressed, now we are tying off and we have a tied off bundle in the chamber. Here's my dad finishing it off. While we have some time, my old man is coming to take over for me, so I'll just sit down and tell you my experience. It was positive, it was good. This machine is really easy to operate. I haven't had a single bale jam up. Uh, the ability to, to twist uh, the machine left and right, uh, pivot, lets you get around corners and pick up bales that are otherwise a little bit difficult. This machine is long, so I would not want to be in a bunch of small fields all day. Just this relatively open field, but small, was a little bit hard to open up, uh, but once you got it open up and rolling, it was just fine. Pretty much the only thing you're doing is watching, I mean, obviously you're watching all the terrain, holes, rocks, all that, you know, you're, you're paying attention, but as far as the screen, the performance of the machine, you're watching this block fill up. So it appears I have one in the initial tier of three. I'll kick two more in, 
That'll make six full tiers and we'll have one more tier three to kick in and that'll be 21 bales in the bundle and then this will tie off. And there'll be something up here that says like uh, initializing plunger compression compression, and it counts to uh, somewhere around a thousand and it ties off. And that's all you're pretty much watching for. There doesn't seem to be cycle times or spots where you need to slow down. At least not this lighter third cutting. Maybe first cutting you could reach to the capacity, but this is pretty much no problem for the machine to handle. There's maybe, I don't know, 50 or 60 more bales out here, and I'll walk behind the machine while my dad's using it, maybe throw the drone up in the air, and that'll be it. Here is the very first bundle we made out of this field. Look at that. Wow. That's really prime. That's really phenomenal stuff. It's tainted by these first three bales of second cut orchard grass, which is okay. Uh, when bales stay in the chamber of a baler for a while, they just get squatty and small and compacted and all that stuff. So yeah, you can see the string kind of slipped off the first bale, but I guarantee the bundle will still hold together. And it's, it is what it is. Very tight strings here, like banjos. And as you can see, we have another bundle about to fall out of the machine. Uh, I assume one or two more plunges and it'll drop down. Nice That's some nice looking hay. Look at the leaf on it, Dad. It's, I mean, that is really phenomenal. Phenomenal. It smells good. It smells great. So I was going to let you take over and film me a little bit and show what the what's going on with the machine. Okay. It's pretty easy to run. That's pretty good. Yeah. That'd be good. You're going to ride on or just ride alongside? I'll uh, ride alongside. In my amateur ignorance, I forgot and I didn't realize that we had lifted up the back roller table that the bundles slide off of. So I should have taken this adjustment on both sides and put it in this elongated hole so there's some balance and compression with the springs. The reason it's up is because when we're backing into one of our barns, it's raised a little high and we're not worried about scuffing the bottom. If we were handling these bundles differently, meaning they didn't stay standing upright like that, if we had the kicker on the bottom pulled out and it was flipping the bundle sideways and landing so all 21 bales are touching the ground. That's when you run it higher because it needs a little more fall to, to, to flip, essentially. I'm just saying that because that's what I've been told. I've never tried it before. Is there room for me? Huh? Where are you going? He's not gonna let you in, he's almost done. Why don't you get on here? Come on. No. Hey. Why don't you get on the gator? As far as the handling of these new bundles, we are doing it the exact same way. Uh, grabbing them over top and still grabbing three bundles at a time. So instead of 42, we were actually handling 63 at a time. And these bundles are extremely tight, so you have very little sag even with the added weight. So I'll go grab the last two, stick them together. I already have my other tower going on over here. And the outside route specifically that my dad is, is bundling up right now, I'm going to have those separated because that was a double row. There was a little more volume going into the crop. I don't think it was able to dry quite as well. So I'll just have them separate. And when I go to check on these, maybe three to four days from now, I'll check those. And if those are fine, I know that everything else is gonna be just fine because there's no reason it should have been, shouldn't have been even drier. Put that together. Go grab the last one. So obviously there is a one in 21 chance that you would end the field with exactly 21 bales, right? So that's a little bit less than a 5% chance. And unfortunately we needed six more. So we came up to the shop, grabbed some spare bales and got a full bundle in there tied off. So what's really neat about these machines is you can actually go up there, pull two pins, loosen up the chain, the chamber, and we should be able to slide that bundle right out. So, so it's real simple. 
up here, just two pins. They have little, you know, clips on them. Take the pins out. Pry it loose. Put a pin back in just to hold it. And if you're strong enough, Dad, you should be able to pull that out. <laughs> yeah. I'll let you do it. It might help if the ramp was... Take it out of it so it's shock absorbed. I don't know. <laughs> you don't know. I think this took me in, Justin. Oh. We got it. <laughs> I'll pinch you with the telehammer. Okay. There you go. That's all there is to it, cleaning the baler out.